at the very least, a silence so that uh, we don't disturb the flow of the meeting. Um, you'll know the meeting is a meeting in public, not a public meeting, so only the people that are registered to speak will be permitted to do so. Uh, at the appropriate time, I will call you forward to one of the many speakers in, uh, in or microphones, oh, sorry, in front of you. We do have new AV kit. Um, it's fairly straightforward to use, so when you are sat, uh, the button on the right-hand side of the uh, of the speaker will go, if you press that, it will go red and you will be able to speak, you will be live. Um, obviously, when you're done, if you could press it to turn it off um, and that will direct the camera away from you so, uh, so you're no longer on screen. Um, we are not expecting any fire alarms, so if one does go off, please follow us uh, in an orderly fashion across to the car park next to the windmill pub. Um, we will need to check all your names off our register to make sure everyone's got out of the building safely, so please make sure you're there, and once you've been checked off, we can send you on your merry little way. Um, some introductions uh, now, if I may. So to my far right, we have Howard Allison, who is our committee services representative. To my immediate right is Sue Mullins, who is our solicitor. And our plan is in no particular order are Charlotte Dix, Alison Withers, and Victoria Kempton. And to my immediate left is our planning manager, Alice Cosner. Alice, I think you've got a statement to make. I do. Thank you, Chairman. My role is to provide impartial advice and to assist members in their decision taking. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed. Right, let's get into the meeting itself. So first of all, do we have any apologies for absence, please, Howard? Yes, Chair. We have apologies from... Councillor Curtis, for whom we have Councillor Pertigella substituting. Councillor Foreman, for whom Councillor Cargill is substituting. Councillor Rock, for whom Councillor Rolfe is substituting. Councillor Mills and Councillor Crump. Thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any disclosures of interest, please? Councillor Dixon first. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in respect of item seven, uh, it's application 22 slash 02099 FUL. I am the chairman of the trust, which is the applicant in that case. I will uh, leave the committee and speak on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Just on that same item, um, it is for a cricket wicket, I believe, and uh, I, I should disclose that I am a cricketer, uh, albeit an ex-cricketer. I'm a little too old to play anymore. I haven't played at Tanworth, um, uh, and I'm here with an open mind, so I will remain on the committee for that decision. Councillor Cargill, next, please. Thank you, Chair. Yes, item two, which is 22 slash 01958 slash four. I am the ward member for that um, application, uh, although I believe that there has been uh, movement on that particular point. Thank you very much, Councillor Rolfe. Button on the right. I've done it. Thank you. Uh, I need to declare an interest on the first item on the agenda, York House uh, 2201533, <coughs> as I am the county councillor for that ward. You'll be remaining on the committee, though. You're here with an open mind. Is that right? Uh, yes, I will be. Marvellous. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Um, so I've got one more to, uh, disclosure to make. I think we've all received uh, late on this evening um, a message from the uh, ward member for the Pillerton uh, item, which is application, it's number six on our agenda, application 220030FUL. Um, unfortunately, uh, there has been um, a, a medical emergency is probably the wrong thing to say, it probably overdoes it, but there, there, is, uh, the, there is something that happened at home that has caused the the ward member to not be able to be here tonight. Um, she has provided to all of us a copy of her uh, representation. I have a copy in front of me and I'll be reading that out at the appropriate time just so that everyone is aware of that. So unless there are any other dis uh, declarations to make, uh, we will move to the minutes. Is everyone happy with the minutes as presented in the agenda pack? I, have a quick, I can see lots of nodding heads. Yeah, okay, I will sign those after the meeting uh, has finished. Um, Okay, so let's move into our applications themselves. Now, as you've heard from uh, Councillor Cargill, there has been some movement on uh, application 2201958FUL, Rosie's Orchard in Bidford-upon-Avon. Um, the committee trigger, which is uh, the ward member and the parish council um, uh, objections, they have been removed. So we will be delegating that decision to the officers. So that item will no longer be heard tonight. Um, 
Right, let's move into our first full application, which is application reference 2201533FUL and 2201534LBC. Uh, that's York House in Rother Street. Our presenting officer is Charlotte Dix. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. The site is indicated on the map by the black circle. The application site is within the town centre and built-up area boundary of Stratford. This slide shows the application site edged in black. The site fronts onto Rother Street to the east and is fairly a linear in shape, projecting up to Greenhill Street car park on the western side. There's a pedestrian access from Greenhill Street to the north, as well as from Rother Street car park to the south. The red buildings shown on the plan are all listed buildings, with York House itself being Grade 2 listed. The site is within the conservation area, and there's a mix of town centre and residential uses nearby. This is a full planning application and listed building consent for the demolition and yeah, redevelopment of the site. Much of the existing extensions to the rear of the building would, de would be demolished, with the commercial elements being redeveloped. In addition, nine new townhouses would be built to the rear of the site. The site plan at the top of this slide shows the existing site layout, with the proposed site plan shown below. The York House frontage, and as seen on the right-hand side of the screen, would be retained in commercial use, with townhouses 1 to 7 to the rear of this. Separated from this part of the scheme would be townhouses eight and nine, which would abut the existing residential uses nearby. There's no vehicular access to the site for parking. So this slide shows the existing elevations at the top of the screen with the proposed elevations shown below. These elevations are as viewed from the rear of the properties on Greenhill Street. You can see the proposed first floor bow windows and roof gardens and some of the design features mentioned within the report. This slide shows the existing and proposed elevations as viewed from the Playhouse and the Rother Street car park to the south. I just want to draw your attention to the proposed elevations, including the, the flat roof design and glazing element referred to in the report. To provide an idea of the proposed floor space and level of development, I have included the proposed first floor plan on this slide. This shows the proximity to the surrounding built form, for example, the two-storey walls to the north and south of the development. Uh, the distance from the windows on the northern elevation would be approximately three metres from the, the flat element of the wall to the, the boundary wall here. Uh, minimized, well, that would be minimised to about two metres for some of the townhouse bow windows. So this slide shows the proposed second floor plan. So this is showing the living space at second floor level, as well as the roof gardens, which are proposed for all of the townhouses. This photo is taken from Rother Street, so showing the front elevation of York House. You'll note there are predominantly two-storey modest developments on the corner of Rother House and Greenhill Streets, with only the Civic Playhouse building being larger than this. This photo is taken from Greenhill Street, showing the existing pedestrian access into the site. You can see the proximity of two of the nearby hot food takeaways on the road frontage, as well as the rear elevation of the playhouse as you look through the pedestrian entrance to the rear of the photo. On the right-hand side is number 34 Greenhill Street, which is mentioned in the report. So this photo is taken from within the site, showing the existing extensions and printing works. On the left hand side so this is looking west as shown by the arrow on the plan on the right hand side you can see the wall and existing green hill street development on the right hand side of the photo so this photo shows the location of um, townhouse eight where the location of townhouse eight would be on the left hand side and then the rear and side elevations of number 34 green hill street as shown by the arrow here uh, this photo is taken from within the existing building, looking towards number 34 Greenhill Street. The windows for the kitchen referred to in the report are shown centrally in the photo. Uh, you can also see the uh, Grove House development at the rear of the photo. So this photo is taken from Greenhill Street car park, as indicated on the map. 
Uh, so this is looking towards where townhouses eight and nine would be located. Again, you can see number 34 Green Hill Street on the left-hand side now and Grove House on the right-hand side. So just to clarify, there are a few updates within the update sheet. And please also note that the amended plans referred to in the update sheet were in fact received on the 17th of January of this year rather than 17th of February. So officer recommendation is to refuse planning permission and list of building consent applications for redevelopment of the site to create nine new dwellings in line with the reasons and notes on pages 31 and 32 of the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Charlotte, thank you very much indeed. Right, let's call our first speaker of the evening, who is Councillor Ian Fradgley of Stratford Five and Town Council. Good evening, Councillor Fradgley. Now, we've seen you many times before, so I think you've got a good idea of how things are going to go, but you'll have three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning before your time is up. Once you're sat comfortable and ready to go, if you press the button on the right, your microphone will be activated and the time is yours. Right, have you got me? Sorry? You need to pull the microphone forward to you. Okay. Is that okay? Lovely. Cheers. Uh, the principle of new homes within the town centre boundary, with the proviso of also maintaining the town, town's green spaces, is fully supported by Stratford Town Council, as outlined in Stratford's Neighbourhood Plan, Policy H1. And as a result, there has already been a number of housing applications over shops in Bridge Street, High Street and Union Street, and there are potentially more in the pipeline, such as the Windsor Street cinema site and a Bard's Walk rooftop, as well as this particular application. Stratford Town Council wel welcomes such developments in the town centre, which it believes will add to the vibrancy and economic success of the town. And the, so, so the Town Council is in support of this particular application. Items that we, as a Town Council, did request some clarification on came uh, via email from the case officer, and the Town Council, resulting in the Town Council being pleased that this development pays some attention to climate change in the inclusion of air source heat pumps and heat exchangers, although I understand PVs will not be included. And given the town centre location and restrictions on access and deliveries, there is to be a construction environmental management plan. And as an add-on, the developers also inform the town council that they will provide appropriate bicycle parking, and this will include electric so sockets for charging electric bikes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Fraggi, if you could turn your microphone off for me for a moment, please. Uh, members, do we have any questions for our speaker? Councillor Rolfe, please. Um, thank you, Councillor Fraggi. Um, I am a member of the Town Council, so maybe I should declare an interest. I don't sit on planning. But I would like to ask you the following question. Are you... You haven't mentioned parking. Is it something you have... Uh, a problem with in terms of parking in the centre of town? I understand that parking is no longer a, a, a consideration for these, these uh, expanding into the town, bound, within the town boundary. Okay. Uh, but is it a consideration for you as a town councillor that, that the uh, nine, nine properties will produce nine possibly 18 cars parking in and around the town centre, which is already congested. Is it something you discussed at planning at Town Council? Uh, we take it that we do not have to worry about parking in, in, uh, for people living in the town centre. And that's written down somewhere, Council Raw, but I can't actually tell you where. And if you, think that, if you think that's a problem, wait till you get the um, the, the application from the uh, uh, Windsor let's, Street let's, mark. Let's not talk about applications that we're not here to listen to, please. Okay, um, okay. Councillor Dixon next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Fragley, um, 
the report before us uh, has quite a lengthy section on residential amenity, uh, specifically the privacy uh, impacted by, or certainly as far as the plan is concerned, the privacy impacted upon the neighbours of this one should it go ahead. Has the Town Council discussed uh, their comments at all in light of the comments from the planning officer? That was not under our consideration. Councillor Parry, please. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Good evening, Councillor Fudgley. Um, I would just be interested in your, uh, in the Council's views. Um, obviously, York House is Grade 2 listed, and in the officer's report, whilst the drawings show that there's a large external chimney stack that's been retained, there's also potentially part of the 17th century fabric missing from from the existing and proposed drawings um i'm just interested to know what your views are on this on on having such an, uh, a significant part of this um the fabric of the building not present and that has been removed am i on yes um i'm here i'm not here representing myself i'm here representing the town council um, and we we have not actually in depth discussed that particular item okay councillor cargill next please but before councillor cargill speaks i'm just gonna say if, if people could move their microphones a little bit closer to them i sort of this sort of height um whilst they are picking you up it's not necessarily being projected around the room properly so just to, as a reminder Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you. Councillor Fragley, just a comment, please, on the, uh, the bin storage and access, because they say, obviously, the be uh, refuse vehicles can't get into the site there. So I'm presuming that now, <coughs> occasionally, we all have four bins to put out on one day, as it just happens. Uh, what about the access and, and storage of those on the pavement? Has that been considered? Um, may I recommend, Councillor Cargill, that you, you, you might want to go to a site visit. Uh, I have actually been to have a look a couple of days ago. And I can't see any particular problem in moving the bins. Okay, Councillor Harvey, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good evening, Councillor Fudgey. Uh, the report contains the following sentence. I do not consider there would be any private amenity space provided for any of the townhouses. Um, does the town council have a view about the provision of amenity space? Because from the officer's statement, that seems to be a fairly absolute statement. There is none. Is the town council aware of any amenity space available? No, we are not aware of any amenity space. Okay, have we got any more questions for our town councillor? No? In that case, Councillor Fragley, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Okay, and while Councillor Fragley is making his way back, we'll call our next speakers. Now, we have a full squad of uh, applicants and agents. So, first of all, we have Gail Collins, uh, we have Mel Kang, we have Phil Powell, and we have Martin Court. Are you all four coming up to the table in front of us? If you're, if you're here to answer questions, if you want to make your way up, you may be called upon, you may not, but at least you're in the right place. That would be fantastic. So who do I have directly in front of me? Who's going to be doing the main speaking? If that's yourself. Uh, sorry, I don't know who your, your name is. Yeah, I'm Gail Collins, you're planning Gail. agent. Marvellous. Okay, Ms. Collins, then you will have three minutes. I will give you a 30-second warning before your time is up. Uh, otherwise, when you're set and ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm pleased that the report recognises this brownfield site is in the district's most sustainable location for housing and that the principle and scale of development is acceptable. We've been down the pre-application route nearly two years ago, starting with a 16-dwelling scheme with an additional storey height. The amended scheme has been significantly reduced to a smaller and lower nine-unit development. At the heart of this proposal is the refurbishment of the listed York House. This scheme proposes the opening up of the site through the demolition of large unsympathetic extensions. It proposes a row of energy efficient upside down townhouses on a smaller footprint with private roof terrace amenity space and shared amenity space, landscaping, tree planting, benches alongside the bike store that's been mentioned. 
The proposals reflect the site's historic layout, are subservient in height to the listed building and the print works. There were only two objections received to the original larger scheme, and the proposal has satisfied your planning policy, highways, drainage, fire service, and other consultees. Therefore, we're extremely disappointed with the recommendation. On heritage grounds, there is a clearly a misunderstanding about the works proposed the listed building. No works or alterations are proposed the 17th century building. All chimneys are staying. Your conservation officer confirms she does not consider that demonstrable harm is caused to the character or setting of the listed building. In terms of the conservation area, the existing development is unattractive and detracts from its character and appearance. Policy does not require proposals to copy historic elements. And in the report's conclusion and planning balance, the public benefits of replacing an unrestricted general industrial use are not referenced. This is a key test in the planning balance. In terms of noise, a pragmatic approach to address any noise concerns is needed to bring this site forward for residential use. Some of the commercial units on Greenhill Street have restrictions on noise and hours of operation which could be enforced. The applicant owns the flats next to the site, adjacent to the Dolphin Fish Bar, and has no record of complaints. And your development requirements, SPD, says that non-opening windows are acceptable in certain situations, but the report does not address why mechanical or passive ventilation is unacceptable here. In terms of amenity, um, for future residents, your officer's report on daylight and sunlight is incorrect, as our submitted report confirms that overall levels are acceptable. And to confirm, the immediate flanking buildings are single storey. They rise up to two storey, but they are single storey height. 30 seconds. In respect of a private amenity space, we've got the roof, gardens and terraces, which again are set out in your development requirements. And in terms of neighbours to the site, no objections have been received from Grove House, and the building is already impacted upon by the existing building. And windows can be altered if needed in 34 Greenhill Street, as this is the applicant's property. In summary, the heritage, noise and amenity issues can be overcome by amended plans or planning conditions. This is a site where residential development is supported by policy. It brings a listed building back into a viable use and will contribute to the centre's vitality and viability. There are significant public benefits arising. I'm it, afraid it, I'm going to have to stop you there because okay, you have just you. gone over your time. But thank That's you very thank much. Thank you very indeed. much. Uh, members, do we have any questions for any of the panel that are in front of us? Councillor Rolfe first, please. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, you mentioned... Um, that uh, there are things that can be overcome by a condition. Um, do you have any views on how you can overcome the noise issue being so close to the playhouse when the playhouse is performing and their back door is open and people are outside? Do you have any thoughts as to how you could overcome this problem? Um, yes, if I may. Um, I've, we've got the noise consultant here who actually um, looked specifically at the noise from the playhouse um, and a survey was done of the noise in the worst case scenario and was found to be acceptable and that has been accepted by, by your environmental health officer as well. Thank okay. you. Sorry, if, if I may follow up. But vice versa, uh, um, you know, if it's a sunny evening and, and people have their windows <laughs> open on the on the proposed development, the noise from there to the playhouse. Um, good evening. Um, yes, we, we carried out a, um, a noise survey to represent a worst case scenario with a, with a live jazz band playing at the, at the playhouse and nothing was audible at the uh, proposal. Uh, it it, it correspondingly makes sense that should anybody be on there, uh, balcony enjoying a, a, an evening in the summer or whatever um, the, the, the reciprocal will be the same there shouldn't be any impact at the at the playhouse given the structure of the playhouse okay councillor parry next please thank you chair good evening um i just wonder whether you can explain um i mean it might might be an error but um it was a similar question i posed to councillor fragile as to why the applicant has decided not to include this external stack that is part of the 17th century fabric of the building in your plans. Um, I'd just like to know why, it, 
because obviously it's a it's a key part being in the conservation area and it would be helpful to have a good understanding of that thank you but button on the right should do the job if it doesn't there's a little card in front of you if you swipe that on the left side it should activate and then you press the button on the on the right we're on fabulous uh, hi I'm, I'm the architect for the scheme so, sorry, the, the, uh, that, that <laughs> we might have a glitch on it. I did say it before, this is all eight new AV equipment and that one suddenly has decided to turn off. So if you want to use the, the one to, uh, to your left, fabulous. Sorry about that. That's Thank okay. you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I'm Phil Powell. I'm the architect for the scheme. Um, the chimney is actually retained. And I think what has happened is that the survey drawings upon which the scheme has been based <laughs> don't actually show the chimney poking through the, the roof. But we, we have confirmed on many occasions now that there is no intention to take that chimney out or for it to be removed from the, the scheme. And that also includes its external stacking side. Uh, and, in, and, 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 and it includes the external stack. Now the, the drawings that we've issued to um, Charlotte recently actually show that that chimney is, is shown on the roof plan now. So it was, it was, hands up, it was an error on our part that it wasn't, we hadn't picked it up. But there is no intention to remove it at all. Thank you. Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Um, can you describe to me, please, how you're going to protect the amenity of the, the residents, uh, especially when you were talking about the roof gardens as well? Because obviously you need to protect that privacy and such. Like. How can you do that, please? If, if, uh, in terms of protecting the amenity from each other between the houses, the roof structure does actually extend down and create um, a storage area for the for the roof um, terrace. So there's somewhere for to put furniture and that sort of thing within a covered uh, area. But that is that that is a structure which um, creates a privacy between each of the roof gardens. Chairman, so are we talking about a what a one meter, two meter section between the the um, the actual. But it, it, it's roof height, so it, 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 I think it, it will, will be uh, reducing from two and a half metres down to one and a half metres, maybe. But certainly, there's going to be no visual um, uh, impact between each of the, uh, the, the roof gardens. You won't be able to see one roof garden from the <coughs> other. Thank you. Yep. OK, do we have any more questions for our applicants, agents and architects? Councillor Harvey, please. Can I... <coughs> Can I repeat my question I posed to Councillor Fragile? Um, the statement in the report that gives me some concerns is, I, the officer, I do not consider there would be any private amenity space provided for any of the townhouses. Could you respond to that? Absolutely. Um, the whole concept is based upon an upside down house. So in other words, the amenity, the private amenity space is at roof level and each house has its own roof, roof terrace, independent of all the other terraces. So it's not true to say that it has no private amenity space. Every house has private amenity space of, of, of anywhere between uh, seven and 11 square meters. They're different because there are different types of, of houses. Uh, but then there is on top of that shared communal space as well at ground level, which I think extends to well over 300 square meters of, of space. And we've, we have centred the development around two courtyard areas, uh, where there are trees and benches and um, other features. Uh, green walls we're introducing into the scheme as well. So there is a mixture of shared, uh, shared um, amenity space and very definitely private amenity space for every, for every dwelling. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Hentress Serafin, please. Hello there. Um, could you give me some idea of the size of the study rooms? That's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, I think it's around about eight, nine square metres, something like that. The, the study rooms uh, appear in units um, six and seven. And I think Charlotte has uh, picked up the fact that they could be converted into bedrooms so that those units could, be, could, be, could become three bedroom units. But I would say, and this was, this was a point that was made to the town council, we don't see these as family homes. We see these as probably downsizers, people wanting to move into the, 
into the town centre, but we don't, we don't think it's the sort of place where families will want to bring children. Um, so if somebody wanted to use that study as a bedroom, there would be nothing to stop them, um, but we see it as a study. We see it more likely that even the two bedroom units are going to be used most of the time as single bedroom units with two people in them, but they'll be able to have guests and maybe use that other second bedroom as a study. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Persigella, please. Thank you. Um, so the Town Council uh, representation mentioned the benefits of some of the design features in relation to tackling climate change. So can you tell us a little bit more about those? And also, I think um, a bicycle storage with electric uh, charging for electric bicycle was mentioned, but I can't see that in the report. So uh, is that going to be proposed as well? And why is it not in the report? Thank you. I can't comment why it's not in the report, but it's certainly part of our proposals that the, it was something that the Town Council specifically asked for, that um, electric charging points would be provided within the bicycle uh, storage, and we'll, we'll definitely be providing those. Um, in terms of our approach to the, the climate emergency, we follow what's called a fabric first approach to <coughs> development, i.e. you increase and put as much insulation into a, in, into a building as is possible and also to limit the amount of air permeability of those buildings. Now what that then in turn relies upon is uh, an MVHR system, which is a mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. But also all of this is tied to using air source heat pumps, which I know is something that's very sort of, you know, part, uh, part of the, the government strategy encouraging people to use air source heat pumps. Each unit will have its own air source heat pump which will be connected to underfloor, low temperature underfloor heating systems. Uh, uh, Councillor Fragley mentioned that there weren't actually any PVs. We haven't said that. What we've said sorry, is that I'll, there's I'll potential. Just, sorry, yeah, we, we're, we're straying a long way from the question, I think, now, which was mainly focused around the bikes. I, I think it was your overall strategy, I think, you asked about. Was it our overall strategy, or have I strayed beyond your, your question? Well, I, I would like to know if you're going to provide PV um, you know, renewable that, energy. In that case, Sorry, it is actually indicated on the diagram that we produced for, as part of our sustainability strategy, that there was potential to put PVs in. And without wanting to put words in my client's mouth, who's here, he's actually committed to putting those in. But it would be part, we, we would see the whole m and &E, the whole mechanical and electrical strategy as being part of a condition for us to supply that information. But it could be conditioned. Sorry for interrupting you there. Councillor Parry. Thank you. I'll come back again. I know you highlighted about the amended plans of, that now have this stack. And I notice in the update sheet, um, obviously, as, as you had explained, that the officers hadn't time to um, consider the amended plans. Are there any other, were there any other significant changes in the amended plans that would... I, I'm, I'm just interested to know... Um, apart from an, any other corrections that we might not be aware of that were part of the original plan that might have been left off by, yes. by the drawings? Uh, yes. Um, the, there are two modern partitions at first floor level that we had indicated in outline on our plan. And in the amended plans that we've submitted to Charlotte, we've shown those partitions as retained. Um, that They're not part of the 17th century building there's something that was installed in the 1950s or 60s we think as as part of the office refurb that was was carried out um, but just for clarity we've made sure that they're shown as being retained whereas before we just showed them in outline i think that and, I, and I've, I, I've i've explained to charlotte that i think that is probably one of the reasons why there was so much confusion as to what it was that we were actually proposing to do to the 17th century to the 17th, 17th century part of the, the building. Just to reiterate, there are no works proposed other than repairs and restoration. Councillor Dixon, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm coming, I'm looking at the uh, report on page 23, the central paragraph there is referring to the privacy of neighbours. Um, I remember that uh, Gail, in uh, her comments, etc., commented that there hadn't been any objections uh, from nearby residents, etc. However, that does not necessarily cover the case as to whether or not their privacy will be impacted by these proposals. Would you like to uh, 
talk to that particular aspect, please? Yeah, I think that this, this comment probably related more than, than anything else to units eight and nine, which uh, r replace what is at the moment a tall but single-storey building. And the concern uh, that Charlotte had was the, the impact upon the, um, the adjoining building, which actually belongs now to our, to our client. Um, and perhaps this is something that needs to be discussed, uh, but we, we, we were uh, content that the way that we designed the building wouldn't impact upon the privacy of those, those units, because those units have windows facing in other directions than the, uh, the two kitchen windows, which are the, 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 the main point of concern. If I may, Chairman, I don't think it was a matter of light, it was a matter of privacy. Obviously, if you've got the view into, it's irre irrelevant as to what that yeah. window serves, I, and whether there is a we, dual, dual light. We, we, understand the, we understand the comment, and, and uh, we, we, we would take that on board, but we, can, we think that there are options to address that particular concern in detail, one of which is to make alterations to the building at number 34, as well as maybe making alterations to the scheme proposals. But we're open to discussion on that. Thank you. Okay, do we have any more questions for our applicants, agents, and everyone else? No? In that case, to all of you, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Okay, we will move to our final speaker on this item, who is Councillor Jenny Fradgley, our ward member. Uh, Councillor Fradgley, you will have five minutes. I will give you a 30-second warning before your time is up. Once you're settled and comfortable, button on the right and the floor is yours. Is that okay? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, the application is for nine townhouses and it's been reduced from 15 and the refurbishment of the Grade 2 listed building. The interior of the listed building is in a sorry state and needs sensitive attention to create the commercial rooms that will provide quality employment opportunities in the centre of the town and the conservation area. The seven townhouses will occupy the footprint of the existing uh, 20th century paintworks, 19th, 20th century paintworks, while the remaining two will be in a separate building at the end of the plot, close to townhouse which will provide quality residences in a sustainable site, contributing to the vibrancy and economic success of the town. This principle is agreed by SDC as well as by STC. I agree this is a narrow plot of land, but this innovative design has produced in all nine spacious townhouses with good amenity space. I must emphasize that each one of these properties has space to walk out outside and sit and enjoy the outside space. A first floor, uh, <coughs> it's a second floor garden for each dwelling. More private space than many town centre homes afford. There are also two further amenity spaces, one small space to the north with two trees along the uh, access um, uh, corridor and one to the west providing a larger open space between uh, the seven townhouses and townhouse eight and nine. With two more trees, cycle storage, as we've heard, electric charging points, bin stores, uh, with easy and the bin stores have easy access to Greenhill Street. Uh, you saw the passageway in the, in the um, photographs provided. At the moment, this area is a rubbish dump with all kinds of litter. Uh, we've talked about the chimney stack. I don't think I need to say that anymore. I think you know about the chimney stack. Um, Comments are made about ground floor windows looking onto the brick wall close to the arts house. Uh, there are, however, on the first floor, there is a light well which actually allows light to flood into those bedrooms from the first floor. And there are the oriel windows on the other side which provide um, views into the passageway that uh, connects the front doors. Um, the exhaust systems on the Dolphin Fish and Chip Shop have been highlighted as a potential issue for noise and smells. We've heard about the litigation that takes place uh, to, to control that from within uh, the construction of these um, houses. However, 34 Greenhill Street is at a similar distance from the fish bar. Um, 
I've, sorry, I've, I've amended these as, as we've gone through. Um, this, some, some comments have been made about the contemporary design being uh, at odds with the conservation area. <coughs> I think we all agree that we actually live in the 21st century and we should be leaving a footprint of our own views and attitudes towards um, architecture and living space. And we've heard that this is actually going to be well insulated, it's going to have solar gain, it's going to have um, uh, uh, ground source, heat source pumps. So I think we're covering and actually showing to the next generations and generations to come on this small site a really fascinating, innovative uh, development that will actually provide residences for downsizers, which is particularly important, and also vibrancy for the town. I'm aware that I've been listening. <coughs> there have been a lot of confusions about what is here, what is there, does this work, no amenity space when there patently is. If you are at all concerned about what view you would give to this to refuse or approve, especially if you're minded to refuse, before you do that, you should certainly make a site visit. If you go to the site and see exactly what is on offer there, it clarifies um, the, the information you've been given in the sheets, a lot of which has been confused and you've been questioning it. So I, as a <coughs> ward councillor, I really support this development. I think it adds to the town centre. I'm looking forward to the historic building being brought back into commercial use. And um, I support the proposal. Councillor Fragi, thank you very much indeed. Members, do we have any questions for our ward member, please? Councillor Rolfe. Um, thank you. Um, site visits. Um, I mean, as you, as you know, and I've had my hand slapped on many occasions about not asking for a site visit. Um, I personally think uh, that a site visit would actually Councillor, benefit Councillor me. Councillor Rolfe, you're moving towards debate at the moment. Have you, okay. got, a, have you got a question for Councillor Fragley, please? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have a question for our ward member? No. In that case, Councillor Fragi, thank you very much for your time and contribution this evening. Thank you. Uh, now, members, we will now move to points of clarification to our officers. I'm going to kick us off because I must admit I am frightfully confused now. Um, we've heard about amended drawings and amended plans. Those amended drawings and plans appear, from what we heard, to overcome a lot of the concerns that have been expressed in the report. Have uh, those amended plans, have they been considered and your concerns are still valid? Um, or are they relatively new amended plans? I'm, I, I'm frightfully confused by it. So the amended plans that were received um, yesterday afternoon, which have been discussed this evening in terms of the impact on the listed building and the chimney stack, etc. Um, due to the, the time of receipt yesterday afternoon, we haven't obviously had the time to accept them and be able to consider them formally and be able to reconsult with our conservation officer and Historic England. So we haven't been able to assess those changes that are contained within the amended plans. So as it's presented in front of us, we are making a decision on the plans as they were, not the amended plans that have been put forward. That's correct. You're um, assessing it in terms of the current submission of the, of the plans, not the, not the amended plans that have been referred to received okay. yesterday. Lovely. That's very helpful. Thank you. Councillor Rolf. Um, in which case, would it help if we deferred this in order We're still to in discuss questions. the amended? We will get to that in the debate. Um, I'm going to get through the questions first. Okay, so one of the questions the I have um, is on the bottom of page 22 because <coughs> I just need to see this. So, nonetheless, the additional height and proximity at less than two and a half metres distance of, uh, uh, impacts significantly on the first floor south-facing windows on unit, units three and four at the townhouse, 34 Greenhill Street. Can, have you got a picture of that? Have you got... Can you demonstrate that? Because I'm slightly confused about... And it's, and, and it's two metres, you said. Yes, let me just share my screen quickly. Okay. 
so it's referring to this distance here. So it's from the side of townhouse eight, which I'm not sure if you can see my cursor properly. But, um, So, it, yes, that it's referring to this distance here. So from the side of townhouse eight um, to the, the side units of those properties on Greenhill Street. Um, and I do have a photo as well, which should help understand that relationship. Uh, so the distance is uh, less than two and a half metres. So it's basically shown by this photo. So this is the existing building, which admittedly would be moved slightly um, further away from Greenhill Street, but it would be two metres higher to the, the roof, and then you've also got the, the storage element for the roof gardens on top of that. So it would be almost four metres higher where it's actually the central part, which is for the storage bit. So it's these windows here that I'm referring to in the report, which are the kitchen windows for units three and four. So, and the distance would be um, less than two and a half metres from these windows to where the, the side elevation would be of townhouse eight. So just to follow, the impact of overlooking would, so, would be from the four metre looking down? Yes, yeah, so the roof gardens would be um, higher than the existing um, roof that you can see. So they would be at least two metres higher. So that, that would have the ability to look down onto the, the windows to some extent. But the main concern is really in terms of that brick wall and the proximity to those windows and the impact then on daylight provision and outlook from those windows. Thank you very much. Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you. Charlotte, there were two, items, uh, two, two things mentioned during the presentations, one on ventilation and one on lighting. Could you just comment on those, please? <coughs> So in terms of the impact on residential amenity, um, so the, the issue raised by environmental health is regards to noise. So that's disturbance from the nearby takeaway units on Greenhill Street. So the three units that are in close proximity to the townhouses. Um, and because of the opening hours that they have, um, um, and in terms of the ability to open, one of the units can open until three o'clock. Um, and obviously that's into nighttime hours. Um, and then, so we've looked, we've assessed the whole application in terms of the noise for any prospective occupiers and environmental health have raised concerns in that regard. Um, in terms of my assessment, I've looked at whether there are any other mitigating factors that would be able to be employed, but on, in the balance of, of assessing the plan application, because there's a number of issues in terms of amenity, I don't consider that that could be something that could be employed on this site. Um, and in terms of lighting. Councillor Cargill, if you're going to speak, if you could put your microphone on, please. Do apologise, Chair. Yeah, it was the, I think it was the amount of light getting into the, um, the, the buildings that was mentioned. Right, I see. So in terms of the daylight provision to the future occupiers, the concerns that I've raised are predominantly due to the, if I just show you the proposed plan. So this is the first floor plan. Um, sorry, this is the first floor plan that's proposed. So my concerns are predominantly to do with the windows along the northern elevation and the proximity to this wall here. So, and at ground floor level, so the windows at ground floor level are pretty much in line with this existing straight feature, straight wall there. So it's three meters distance from this point here to the nearby wall. And then at first floor level, because of the design of the windows, it actually gets closer. So it's, it's about two meters proximity for some of the nearest townhouses. So my concern, particularly because those are north facing windows, that they wouldn't have sufficient daylight or, or outlook because of the proximity of the existing development. And again, in terms of the southern elevation as well, some of the, win some of the um, rooms at ground floor level are three rooms, but they're not going to have sufficient daylight provision to the south facing windows either because of the, the two story playhouse to the, the southern element of the site. So it's, it's both of those factors that have led me to consider that the, the impact on daylight would be quite poor. Councillor Harvey, please. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> um, I share your, your um, confusion to an extent. There are two strands where, in presentations that we've received, 
where there's contradictory information. One relates to noise that I picked up, uh, which I think we've already dealt with to some extent, and the other was amenity space. Um, so in the light of, I, I'm confused, the, the, the statements are diametrically op opposite. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about how that might be resolved. And secondly, um, on page 2425, there is reference to the implications of, on the site um, being occupied as, a, as residences on existing businesses and the environmental health officer, it is reported, uh, has raised objections which you consider significant. So my question is, is the environmental health officer on that basis still concerned and do you still regard that as significant? Yes, so in terms of the noise disturbance levels, revised information was received from the applicant during the life of the application, which was then consulted, well, we consulted environmental health, and they have still retained their objection to the scheme based on the existing units that are in close proximity to the site and the levels of disturbance that they would expect because of the opening hours and because of the proximity of the um, extraction equipment. Um, that's, that's in place at the moment. So their concerns are still extant and I concur with, with the objection that they've raised in terms of the impacts on amenity for any occupiers of the townhouses. Um, in terms of um, the impact on the existing buildings, so you're referring to the, the commercial elements, is that correct? It is, but uh, could, I, could you also respond to the, the amenity? question oh yes so in terms of the private amenity space because the the roof gardens are um what's been put forward as part of the application is that the private amenity space however because of um the way it's sited at second floor level and obviously the ability for um people to be able to look into that space it's it's not something that's considered as private amenity space for the occupiers um so that, that's why we have considered that there's no private amenity space for any of the, the townhouses. So in terms of the existing buildings, that's in relation to the impact on commercial properties, that's right. Uh, so I have covered this in my report. Let me just refer you to the right section. Yeah, so it's... the close to the bottom of page 24. So, um, in effect, we have to look at the existing situation in terms of current activities and also other activities that the businesses could carry out in terms of their existing licenses as well. Um, so, in terms of what's been proposed, the and because of the existing extracts of the businesses, it could be very likely to create a nuisance for the occupiers because of the proximity, which could then obviously lead to complaints for those businesses, which could impact on, on the operation of those businesses. Councillor Parry, next, please. Thank you. It's just a little bit of clarification, if I may. Um, in, in the event we progress um, and, and there is no deferral, um, can the officers advise if if we if, if that progressed in that direction and we were minded to grant is it possible to condition the retention of the external chimney stack as reported in the presentation from the applicant during this committee meeting appreciate it's in the amended plans that are yet to be thoroughly looked at but on the basis of what the applicant has said during the committee this evening, would we need to condition that or is that not a possibility? My advice would be that, as always, members need to consider the plans in front of you. Uh, yes, amended plans were submitted, but they were submitted so late in the day that, to my mind, we can't have regard to them. So my advice would be that we shouldn't be conditioning things that are subject to amended plans when we've confirmed to the applicant and agent that we're not accepting them. Councillor Rolfe, please. Um, I'm going to bring back the amenity space issue again because um, I am slightly confused. So <coughs> uh, there are roof gardens, and I think I'm hearing you say 
that they're not private, but they're on the roof. So why aren't they private? Because of the proximity of nearby viewpoints, um, you would have views of the second floor of the development. So you would, and certainly in terms of townhouses eight and nine, because of the proximity to the Green Hill Street car park um, and other existing residential units nearby, there would be clear views of, of those gardens. But no, <coughs> but no one will be looking down on the gardens. You would only be looking up on the gardens so those with roof spent roof gardens could make sure that no one from down below could see is that right in terms of the proximity of number 34 green hill street there are windows on the elevations that would be able to overlook into the gardens as well okay. council Gallup, please Yes, so in terms of historic England and their objections, um, are there objections because there isn't a full or more detailed assessment of the proposals or are they objecting on a particular aspect? The objections from historic England are focused on the fact that the information is con contradictory in part. So in terms of the plans that were submitted and, and the revised information, it is quite contradictory. So it, it hasn't been clarified in the current submission as to impacts on the chimney, etc. So that, that's the basis of their objection. Okay, any more points of clarification, members? Good, let's move into debate. Councillor Redden, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I hear a lot of confusion. Um, I think there are amended plans in the offing. There's details that could be clarified and overcome some of the conditions for refusal. I think that there's an opportunity where the ward member could also request a site visit, which was also mentioned. So I would like to propose that we defer, please. Thank you very much. I'll second that. And then I'll call in our next speaker, who is Councillor Parry. So I was going to second that. <laughs> Councillor Dixon? Uh, no comment in view of the circumstances. Councillor Rolfe? I was going to second that. <laughs> okay. Marvellous. Okay. Uh, yeah, for me, this is, it, it's become so confusing. Um, I simply cannot make an appropriate decision on it. If I'm just looking at what the, is in the report and what is put in front of us, which is what we're supposed to do, um, then I, I would be inclined to go with the officer's recommendation. In the knowledge that we have amended plans, and given there is some clear support from the ward member and the town council who represent the town, I think it is in the best interests of us all to make sure that we do defer and give full regard to these amended plans. And hopefully we'll come back less confused and be able to make a proper judgment. So could I have please a show of hands for those in favor of deferring? Could I ask that a site visit is um, involved? Um, bear with me. So I, we had just moved to a vote. I'm gonna, I am going to allow you to speak, but I need to, to, I'd need to have very clear planning reasons why you want to go for a site visit before we can include that. I think uh, during the um, uh, questions for clarification, things were not clarified. And I think by seeing the site, I think a lot will come a lot will appear more distinct and 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 I just think it would help those going on a site visit to see it personally. Councillor Redden, given it was yourself that proposed the deferral, are you happy to propose the deferral in order for the plans to be uh, fully assessed and also to include a site visit for the reasons we've just heard from Councillor Rolfe? Yes, Chair, I'm okay with that. Okay, a seconder, I will also agree to that. Councillor Parry, you've put your hand up. Would you like to speak as well? Um, I was just offering to clarify, I think the site visit in particular needs to look at the private amenity, the aspects and the views of that, because I think that is, was the key area that was unclear. So um, if, if the site visit can be undertaken that specific, specifically draws upon the private amenity space. Lovely, thank you. Again, Councillor Eden, you're happy with that? All good, Chair. Marvellous, so am I. In that case, 
the proposal uh, is to defer uh, for the reasons given and also to conduct a site visit again for the reasons given. Could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of deferral? That is unanimous. Committee therefore resolves to defer applications, both applications, 2201533 FUL. I think I have to take it separately, don't I, for the LBC? Unfortunately, we do have to take the same one separately for the LBC, so Councillor Redden, just to confirm, same, reason, same uh, proposal? Confirmed, Chair. Thank you very much. Seconded by myself. So, could I have a show of hands for the LBC? Councillor Parry, Councillor Percy Geller, uh, we're, we're looking at the LBC, the same proposal has been put. Thank you very much. That is also unanimous. So, committee therefore resolves uh, to defer application 22-01534 LBC. Right. I'm going to take a breather while we have a changeover of our planning officer. Okay, now we are fully back to full service. Um, uh, our presenting officer for application 22-00030 FUL Dickensbury Farm is Alison Withers. Alison, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The application uh, is located to the north of the village of Pillerton Priors off Walton Lane. The lo location is shown by the black dot. This... <laughs> This planning application requests a change of use of an existing agricultural building and associated hard standing parking area to, the, to, to a use to include B8 storage uh, and or uh, a use now called EG3, which used to be called B1, um, for any industrial process which can be carried out in any residential area without causing detriment to the amenity of the area. The building itself requires no alterations as part of the proposals. Alterations to the building in, including a small toilet, a rock, locker room, uh, roller shutter doors and cladding on the south elevation and the concrete forecourt have been approved previously. So here is a recent aerial view of the site showing the application site outlined in red down here. It's located off Walton Lane, which runs from Pillerton Priors, here, just the bottom of the screen, up to the Fossway here. Walton Lane is generally three to three and a half metres in width, single carriageway, and is subject to the national speed limit, 60 miles per hour, which changes to 30 miles per, how, per hour, approximately 90 metres to the south on the approach to the village, or in this sort of area here. So, approximately, two th approximately 250 metres to the south of the access, Walton Lane widens slightly to allow two vehicles to pass. Between the site and the widened section, there are a few field gates and a further area that is used by vehicles to pass. The, it's acknowledged that there are a few passing places on the northern section of Walton Lane. 
The transport statement concludes the following trip generations. So for the B1 use, it's uh, worst case scenario would be 25 vehicles today, including three HGVs per day. And for the B8 storage use, it's 13 vehicles per day, including zero HGVs. In this particular location, there is a lorry ban already in existence for lorries over seven and a half tons um, along several of the local lanes, including Walton Lane. However, HGVs over seven and a half tons who are accessing existing local businesses along Walton Lane are exempt from this ban. And there is no restriction as to which direction through the lorry ban area the HGVs can navigate to get to their businesses. As an alternative to restricting lorry movements by condition, the applicant has agreed to uh, enter into a freight management plan by condition, which would recommend a routing plan, um, which would be uh, provided to their suppliers or um, contractors. Uh, and it, traffic would be ideally routed via Kyneton Road from the south and not, not to approach from the north from Foss Way. So the, the HG routing element of the freight management plan would however be optional and it would not be able to be enforced. The existing agricultural building is here and this is the concrete forecourt. Parking, parking and layout plan has been provided that demonstrates that there's sufficient space for parking and turning for the vehicles within the application site. So the access onto Walton Lane would be improved to provide visibility splays and the, bell, the existing bell mouth would be widened to allow a car to pass uh, a lorry uh, um, on, on the access. Sections of the existing vegetation along Walton Lane would have to be removed, but they will be replaced with a mixed native hedgerow. So this is the view to the north, and this is the view to the south. You can see the hedgerows. So these are some views of the existing building and these are some views of the existing access and these are some views of Walton Lane itself. To illustrate the situation a bit more I've also got a video so if you bear with I'll So this is uh, starting off in Pillerton Priors itself, just at the very uh, start of Walton Lane. So you can see through the trees, which have no leaves on at the moment, you can see the existing barn uh, just here where my cursor is. I don't know if you can see that. So if I just... Uh, so the, the video takes you up the road past Dickensbury Farm so you can see the existing lanes. <coughs> oh. oh, let me, hang on. Oh, yes, there you go. So the road is a bit wider towards the southern, southern section. So this is now heading north out of Pillerton Priors towards, towards the Foss Way. There's a speed limit.
So this is Dickensbury Farm approaching on the left, hedgerow that would be removed. I won't carry on right to the very end because it's quite long. I just wanted you to have a feel for the character of the area. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. So uh, <coughs> that's the end of my presentation. So, Mr Chairman, there are no updates. Um, and the recommendation is the application be granted for the reasons detailed in the report, subject to the conditions and notes, wording and numbering delegated to officers. Thank you. Alison, thank you very much indeed. Let's call our first speaker on this item, who is Dave McWhirter. I think I've pronounced that correctly. I hope I have. You got that very well. Marvellous. And Mr McWhirter is the Vice Chairman of Person Priors Parish Council. And once you're sat, comfortable and ready to go, uh, if you press the button on the right of your speaker and the floor will be yours. I, I will, of course, if you have three minutes, I'll give you a 30 second warning. I should have said that before. When you're ready, the floor is yours. The Parish Council objects to this application. We believe the proposal would breach policy AS10 of the course strategy, which relates to the countryside and villages and states, all proposals we thoroughly assessed to avoid a level of increase in traffic on rural roads that would be harmful to the local area. The issue here is the road access. It's interesting, you've just seen it. It's a road access and makes it an unsuitable site for a storage and distribution depot. Walton Lane is a narrow, single carriageway. It's used by villagers for recreational walking, dog walking, jogging, that sort of stuff, horse riding. There are virtually no opportunities for vehicles to pass one another. It has a seven and a half ton weight limit, but vehicles above that limit can use it if they're loading or unloading. So you actually have the potential here for heavy goods vehicles well above seven and a half tons to be accessing this site on the roads you saw. We argue that granting permission will result in an unacceptable increase in goods vehicles coming along through the village and using Walton Lane. Interestingly, our concerns have been shared by the county highways who originally objected in the letter of the 10th of February last year, County Highways state, the Highway Authority has concerns with regard to intensification of use of Walton Lane. In a further letter at the end of May, after the transport statement, Highways, again clearly uncomfortable, made the point that without details of the user of the B1 or the B8 distribution facility, they were, quote, unable to wholly agree, unquote, with some of the figures. The transport statement estimates an additional 38 vehicles per day. We argue this is just finger in the air because we don't know who is going to use the facility. And until you know who's going to use it, what sort of business it's going to be used for, how on earth can you say how many vehicles are going to be using it? So that is simply ju just not believable for us. You might consider attaching conditions to the permission um, we would argue the planning officer's report contains 20, 20 conditions, 20. And if you're up at 20, you've got some issues about this place. And I'd also politely remind you that this site has a history of non-compliance with conditions such as Stratford District Council took the applicant to court over animal carcass issues some years ago. 30 seconds. And in any event, the fundamental issue is the road is not suitable for heavy goods vehicles and there's nothing you can do to change that. We urge you to refuse the application on the grounds that Walton Lane is unsuitable for heavy goods vehicles, that the potential for an increase in goods vehicles is open-ended because we don't know who is going to use it, and that all of this contravenes policy AS10, which is designed to protect the villages and rural roads. Thank you. Spot on your time. Thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions for our parish council? Councillor Cargill, please. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned about highways, but I noticed that highways now have no objection. So have they, all those been addressed as far as highways concerned? 
Well, I, we're very disappointed that highways have, have withdrawn from the discussion. They originally objected. They called for a transport statement, which was assigned to judge how many vehicles were likely to be using it for a B1 facility and how many for a B8 facility. So the transport statement came up with these figures of 25 additional vehicles for a B1 and, and 13 for a B8. But interestingly, even in the transport statement, they said, but these figures are a little bit uh, uncertain because it depends who's going to be using it. Highways then locked on to the 25 vehicles for the B1 and ignored the B8 thing altogether and so seemed to have withdrawn their objection uh, on half of the information that was available to us. And no matter how many times we go back to highways and said, what's going on, why have you done this? Uh, it's fair to say we don't get any response to that. So I cannot give you a satisfactory reason but they clearly, from their letters, don't particularly like it. Thank you very much. Councillor Harvey, please. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> um, I understand your concern about the veracity of the numbers that have been put forward as potential uh, traffic movements. Does the Parish Council have any information on the existing level of traffic? Because I'm trying to get a sense of what the additional burden might be on top of what? Do you have any information? I, uh, gosh, I, I wouldn't like to be nailed to the wall on, on the precision of the figures, but I think it talked about... I mean, it, it's essentially Walton Lane is a rat run. There are the two farms. There's Dickensbury Farm, as you come up from the village, Dickensbury Farm to your right and another farm to your left, and after that, you've got a mile that takes you to the Foss Way. So it's, it's private cars. Sometimes you can get two or three an hour, uh, rush hours, you'll get them then, and then for hours you, you won't see anybody on it at all. You'll see a few farm tractors, we get a, quite a few of those, but I can't give you a figure, I'm, I'm afraid, other than to say two, two things really. One is, even if it's 38 additional vehicles, that is a significant increase, we feel, and in any event, you can't trust the 38. Where does that figure come from? Thank you very much. Anyone else have any questions for our parish council? No? In that case, Councillor McWhorter, thank you very much for your time and contribution. Of course, your patience this evening as well. Now, members, um, I made a bit of a mistake earlier. Uh, I, you will remember during the disclosures, uh, I mentioned that we had received an email from uh, our ward member for this item. Um, it came in at a very late hour as we were prepping and organising ourselves for tonight and the inference was that the ward member was registered to speak and on that basis I said that I would read out the statement that had been made. It has now transpired that the ward member is not registered to speak so even if the ward member was here they would not be afforded the time to be heard. So I am not going to read out the statement that has been provided. Hopefully you will have, you, it came through not long after five so you may have had a chance to read it. What I will say is the main points contained within it are the same that we have just heard from the parish council and it is of a, an objection um, so i just wanted to make that very clear so we can move to points of clarification from our officers councillor parry please thank you i wonder whether the officers can give me some indication of the weight that can be attributed to as10 and in particular the the point on uh, the impact on rural roads. Um, so as AS10 is an up-to-date policy within our core strategy, members can give that full weight. So if members consider that it doesn't comply with that part of AS10 and there's therefore a breach, that could potentially form a reason for refusal quite reasonably in terms of considering the development plan. We obviously don't have the objection from County Highways, but it, it is within AS10, so thank you. Councillor Roth, please. Uh, thank you. Alison, could you just reiterate what you said about the tonnage and the uh, whether it's enforceable or not? Could you just, uh, I think I know, but if you could just explain again. Thank you. So, so in the area, there is a, uh, a ban on lorries over seven and a half tonnes. 
so which includes Walton Lane. So existing businesses, though, are exempt, including Walton Lane. So there's no restriction as to which direction through the lorry ban area HD, HGVs visiting existing businesses can go. They can approach from either direction. So basically what you're saying, there is no restriction at all if the vehicle has a legitimate reason for being there. Um, so it, they can't use Walton Lane as a rat run, but if it's to visit an existing, bu an existing business for unloading or loading, they can visit it. So, uh, so, and that's from either direction, but the applicant has, has agreed to enter into a voluntary agreement, but obviously, we wouldn't be able to monitor that very easily because we have no con no method of monitoring who's going where or doing what. Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you, Chair. Alison, a couple of points, if I may. Uh, one is, uh, just following up on that particular point, um, you mentioned that the width of the road is around about 3.5 metres. Um, I note that HGVs are in the region of about 2.9 metres. Are we happy about the fact that um, there shouldn't be any more damage to the verges and such like because of um, you know, large vehicles and uh, people do walk down there. We saw that. So are there any concerns about that first? Um, the, the Walton Lane is a single carriageway. There's not enough space for vehicles to pass each other and there are very few passing places. I can't deny that. However, there are, at the moment, farm vehicles which travel up and down and there is existing traffic. There's no incidences of any accidents on the road. Um, and, but you can see from the video that there is evidently damage to the highway verges already from the current level of traffic. Thank you, Chair. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. The other point I just wanted to, to pick up on was the, uh, the hedge, removal of the hedge for, to create a visibility spray, I assume. Uh, I didn't know if I picked that up correctly. Um, are we happy from a council point of view that that is permissible and it's not going to damage ancient hedgerow or anything like that? Uh, no, definitely not. It's predominantly Lelandia hedge. Okay. So, uh, so and, it, and the visibility splays would be either in highways land or the applicant's ownership. So it can be replanted by condition. Thank you very so much. So that would represent an improvement, I think. Thank you. Councillor Harvey, please. Yeah, Alison, could you confirm that there are no other businesses other than the two farms at the southern end of Walton Lane, in Walton Lane? That's question one. And question two, um, do we have any, do you have any information about the movement of uh, vehicles over seven and a half tons to the existing two businesses? I, do they come, how many are there, and do they tend to come from the south, from, from Pillerton, or from the north, from the Foss? Um, there, wa there was a transport statement submitted, but it doesn't, doesn't go into the detail of what direction the traffic has come from. Um, there is on site already that there are two uses. There's kind of existing farming activities, um, which are include feed deliveries and movements of cattle, which is about two to three HGVs per week. Uh, in addition to that, there's an existing DIY livery uh, business on site, on the same site, which is daily daily upkeep is about six cars and then larger horse boxes about two to four at the weekends both of those activities are going to carry on they're not proposing to cease those so the w from the from the from the change of use and if it was to be a um, like a, a b1 use the worst case scenario is 25 vehicle movements per day on top of what's already coming in and out of the site Okay, members, do we have any more points of clarification to our officers? No, in that case, let's move into debate. Who would like to kick us off? 
Councillor Rolfe. Um, Alison mentioned earlier that um, uh, there were no incidences of accidents on the road, but I, that's not to say that the increase of traffic won't cause more uh, uh, accidents. Uh, I, I personally have concerns about the increased traffic and the uh, we saw on the video walkers and how close cars would be to those walkers and to have some of the European sized lorries going down that single track road um, uh, sends alarm bell bells to me. Councillor Dixon please. Thank you Chairman. Um, I think we all know our rural parts of uh, this, uh, this county and we've all got some narrow lanes in those parts. Um, we can't control the traffic which goes along them. We can't uh, prevent uh, lorries, I don't think over seven and a half tons who aren't delivering actually going along there. It was described as a rat run. Um, it's a pity it is a rat run to the FOSS presumably. Um, but essentially I cannot see a valid plain reason for refusing this application and therefore I will propose that we grant it in accordance with the officer's recommendation. Thank you very much. Councillor Cargill please. Thank you. This is always a tricky one with these sort of things. On the one hand, yes, there is obviously an increase in traffic. I'm sure there will be, and it is a very narrow road. On the other, we are here to try and encourage rural businesses and, and, and in, encourage them to thrive. Uh, and so it's a real, real sort of problem. On balance, however, I, I go with uh, Councillor Dixon. I feel that this is um, a reasonable application, and I with the traffic management plan, I feel that it is a quite achievable. I'm willing to propose. Uh, uh, second. Uh, second. 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 I apologise. Second. Marvellous. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Percy Geller, next, please. Yeah, I just wanted to echo Councillor Rolf's concerns. Um, I mean, the road is a single track country lane, and of course, there is already um, agricultural um, related traffic. <coughs> um, of course, these this is a change of use so there'll be different i suppose type of agvs and traffic and i'm concerned about the intensification especially um if it's used by cyclists by horse riders by walkers um i yes i'm i'm very concerned as well and and the freight management plan if i understood correctly cannot be enforced and is optional. I'm not even sure you can implement it, whether, you know, um, who's going to tell them how you divert or, or, or traffic rerouted. But obviously, if you can enforce it, then it's, it's really not, um, you know, I, I don't think it's something that we can uh, think about or, or consider. Um, so yes, my concerns are mainly uh, about the, uh, the intensification of traffic. And I see the policy AS10, um, you know, w the applications are obviously supported. Uh, however, they need to avoid the level of increase in traffic on rural roads that would be harmful to the area, so to the local area. So I'm minded of that. Thank you. But I, I also appreciate the balance of um, supporting rural businesses. So it's, it's a very challenging application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Parry, please. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think the crux of this whole application is the fact that we don't have an objection from highways. I think if we um, were having a, a, an objection from highways, this would give us um, straightforward reason to refuse this application. Um, here we are again when highways, I'm afraid, do a little bit of their desktop um, review of applications. Um, as the cabinet portfolio holder for economic development, I'm obviously very mindful that we need to be growing business across the district. And I'm also mindful of the fact that sh were we to refuse, um, this would go to appeal because we actually haven't got any solid material planning reason for refusal. We should be doing everything we can to promote rural businesses. 
I have every sympathy with the parish council. I know that particular road um, and have used it frequently. Um, I would also be equally concerned if the freight management plan um, insisted that the HDVs use the Kyneton Road so that actually went through Pillerton, Hersey, Butler's Marston, etc. Um, it is a difficult one. We're always here to make the difficult decisions. Um, I don't like this application, but I am minded to support the officer's recommendation because I do not see with the highways having no objection, we have no other uh, rationale but to grant application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Councillor Hunter Serafin. Thank you. Do we know uh, if highways actually paid a site visit? Um, I have had lengthy, lots of lengthy conversations with them, but I don't know. In my discussions, it was clear that they knew the site and knew the road mm -hmm. and the road conditions but I don't know either way whether they actually physically went there in connection with this application. Okay, before I throw my two pennies worth in, does anyone else want to have a go? No, um, I think Councillor Parry has hit the nail on the head entirely. This, this, this application hinges on uh, the highways. Um, we have a no objection from the highways. The reality is that road is a 60 mile an hour road and anyone within the limit set to the road can go up and down it at 60 miles an hour. I mean, it's f having seen the video, that is quite frightening to think that someone would, but the reality is that is the limit set to the road. Um, so I, there are, as far as I can see, no planning reasons uh, to go against this, so I will also be supporting the officer's recommendation. Now, we have been a proposal to grant from Councillor Dixon. It has been seconded by Councillor Cargill. So could I please have a show of hands for those in favour of granting this application? Six. And those against, please. Three. Uh, so committee therefore resolves to grant application 2200030 FUL at Dickensbury Farm in Pilton Priors. Let's move on to our final application. I think Councillor Dixon is going to make his way to the viewing gallery. While he does that, we will have a change of planning officer. So Victoria Kempton will be joining us imminently. And once she has and she's sat and comfortable, uh, we will be hearing application reference 2202099FUL at Munts Hall Sportsfield in Tanworth in Arden. Victoria, whenever you're ready and comfortable, it's over to you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Permission is sought to construct an artificial cricket strip at Munts Hall Sports Field. The application site is located at the western edge of Tanworth in Arden at, and is marked by the black dot on the map. This slide shows the, this slide shows the site outlined in red with the village of Tanworth in Arden to the east. In terms of constraints, the site lies within the open countryside, Greenbelt and Arden Special Landscape Area. The site is also near to the conservation area, as outlined in pink. Whilst the dash, line, the dash green line shows a position of a public right-of-way, which runs parallel with the southern boundary. This plan shows the position and angle of the proposed artificial strip, which would measure around 30 metres by 2.7 <coughs> metres, with an area of 83 square metres. The black circle indicates the overall area of the pitch, although this does not form part of the application. This aerial image shows the site in relation to the village, with the residential properties to the east and southeast, with co open countryside beyond the other boundaries. The existing ground has been used as a football pitch, with informal games in the summer. In addition to this, there are also tennis courts to the south of the site, along with a pavilion and, and building for scouting organisations to the east of the pitch. 
Photo number one is a view looking to the west with a football goal just in view, whilst the second photo is a view looking towards the east with a pavilion and scout building. These are a couple more photos with image number one showing the tennis courts. And photo number two pans slightly round to the right um, in the direction of a public footpath. So this concludes my presentation. The application is recommended for approval subject to the conditions listed in the report. However, should members be minded to approve the application, an additional um, condition should be added to um, control the plans. Thank you, Chair. Victoria, thank you very much indeed. Let's call our one and only speaker on this item, who is the one and only Councillor Tony Dixon. Good evening, Councillor Dixon. You've got three minutes. I'll give you a 30 second warning for your time is up. The floor is yours. Good evening, Chairman, and thank you, uh, members. Uh, I won't take up three minutes. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank Victoria for her patience with this application, uh, which landed on her desk, uh, I think, back in August. Um, I was surprised, actually, that uh, the provision of a artificial strip, um, which probably can't be seen by anybody except somebody stood on it when you're actually there, actually did require planning consent and permissions. Um, and I do wonder whether or not other cricket grounds, etc., might already have them without planning permission. But that's, uh, that's an aside. What I would mention is that the, the nearest neighbours uh, are supportive of the application. Um, they, in fact, one of them actually recalls when cricket used to be played on the field until the 1970s. Uh, so essentially, it's a request by the Munts Trust. The Munts Trust started uh, over 100 years ago when this field was donated to the community. I'm the chairman of the local trust, and uh, the local cricket club would like to come back. Unfortunately, there isn't space to play football and cricket on the same sports field. And needless to say, when the field is used or has been in use by the, a soccer team, uh, essentially, uh, the playing surface is just not appropriate for cricket, and uh, essentially you've either got to choose one or the other. And we'd rather have a local cricket team rather than uh, a football team, soccer team from across the borders in Worcestershire, who were the uh, previous users of our sports pitch. Uh, I'm very happy to take any questions from members. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions for Councillor Dixon? Councillor Cargill, please. Thank you, Councillor Dixon. I notice in the conditions um, on item two, it says match materials to match those listed, uh, colour to be green. Are you happy with that? Uh, yes, I am, Mr Chairman. Yes. Uh, I have a, council, a question for you. Um, what's your batting average last season? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Poorly. Um, OK, there'd be no further questions, Councillor Dixon. Thank you very much indeed. Um, members, do we have any questions for our officers? Councillor Harvey? Um, Am I right in thinking that the only reason that we're considering this application is predominantly because it's a, an artificial pitch? Is it the question, is, is it the case that if this sports club had decided to install a natural pitch uh, without an artificial element, there would be no need for consent? So we didn't issue a lawful development certificate on the application, but we did feel that the construction of the artificial pitch would be development which doesn't fall under any permitted development rights. So we felt as it was development, it would require planning permission. So I think it's fair to say that generally speaking, if it was proper grass, there's no change of view. So it would probably wouldn't need planning permission. I can't say for sure without LDP, but. So Harvey's going to make a grass cricket wicket in his garden now, I think. Um, OK, uh, in that case, let's move into debate. Um, who would like to kick us off? Councillor Parry, please. I'd like to propose that we grant in accordance with the officer's recommendation. And Councillor Redden, please. In the absence of Councillor Crump. I'm far from stumped on this one. I'm, oh. very, much, I'm very much for it. <laughs> there we go. Right, I'd second Councillor Parry's proposal. Marvellous, thank you very much. Anyone else want to have their say? No, let's move to the vote. So the proposal is to grant, in line with the officer recommendation, can I have a show of hands, please, in favour, please? That is unanimous. Marvellous. Um, members, I don't believe we have any urgent business. No, in that case, I will call the meeting to a close. Thank you very much indeed, and we'll see you next week.